Hi, and welcome back to the Novel Tea Podcast, where we are drinking tea and talking about novels. My name is Alexandra, and I analyze books from sort of like a literary perspective because I love English class. And my name is Emily. I analyze books more from the perspective of a writer and editor because that's my background. I'm kind of all about like what the writer owes their reader. And I'm all about what the reader owes the book. So today, I'm very excited. Well, first of all, let me ask you, what tea are you drinking today? I am drinking um, Harney and Sons English, no, I'm sorry, Earl Grey Supreme, which is like Earl Grey with lemon. Ooh, lots of lemon. Mm -hmm. How about you? How are you liking it? Oh, I'm liking it a lot. I've had their regular Earl Grey, and I will say Supreme, better choice. Yeah, I have to say we were maybe having a 15-minute pre-conversation about tea. I'm doing a London Fog, so if I have like a foamy mustache at any point during this episode, you guys will know why. I mean, that would be the serious novelty podcast. Mm-hmm. Commitment to tea. Yeah. So this week, online, or this month for this episode two, instead of focusing on a single book, we've decided to focus on a particular topic or a particular theme, which is what happens when you as an author decide to make your main character sort of perfect in every kind of way the idealized character no flaws how does that affect your book how does that affect your plotting what are some of the pitfalls the reading experience like how does your reader connect with that or not connect with it right yeah so we wanted to tackle this yeah interesting subject which strangely comes up yeah. too much in fiction. <laughs> yeah, we came up with a lot of examples. We have five books to talk about and analyze today and within this topic. Three of them are from Emily, two of them are from me. Um, and so maybe, Emily, let me ask you what the first book is that you wanted to talk about today. So my first book I chose was Red Rising by Pierce Brown. I made it through 100 pages of this book. I am still angry that I wasted hundred pages worth of time on this book. Yeah. So basically plot line, there is, um, the main character, uh, is kind of the kind of in it's, well, let's start with, the main character is part of a, uh, segregated society and he is in the red zone, which means he's a minor and experiences tragic circumstances that make him decide that he's going to be part of a, a rising against, the higher like a revolution. Religion. Yeah, exactly. But he's going to be the ultimate character in all. Like there are a lot of revolutionaries, but he is the chosen one of all. Yeah. Yeah. That's Very... really interesting because I think there's something different that happens when it's sort of like, oh, we have, you know, Harry Potter is the chosen one or this happens a lot in fantasy stories where you have, you know, a chosen one narrative where it's sort of like greatness is forced upon you. Well, and it's like this revolution has been going on for a while, mm-hmm. but they're just not achieving their goals until oh, yeah. we meet the main character who just brings everything to a new level. Yeah. It is Also a book that's written in first person Mm -hmm. narrative. So the main character is telling his own story, Mm -hmm. which I think adds an extra layer, a problematic layer Mm -hmm. to a character who's wanting you to know how perfect he is. He's perfect in terms of his intellect. He's smarter than everybody. He's perfect in terms of his like physical ability. He can do any physical thing that comes up against him. He can, he has no issues going into test or any kind of like, anxious situation like yeah. he's he's solid he can handle anything i'm tough under pressure yes don't even put more pressure on me the the i think my one of my breaking points with this story is when like he goes through this series of tests and they had to redesign the test in order for him to because like he was excelling at them so well you know yeah. and and also it's written very from much from an attitude of like well yeah of course yeah. Of course, of course, I passed that test. Right. Of course, I did this. Well, naturally, I did that. Right. You know. Yeah. And that's off-putting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think if you think about what would it be like to actually encounter this person like this, yeah, and you're like, that's someone I never want to talk to or hang out with because they're a jerk. There was a moment where, like, <laughs> the what was clearly going to become the romantic character walks on the screen, and I'm like turn around. Don't do this. Don't do this to yourself. <laughs> right. you're, you're not going to like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a problem. I'm also going to be talking quite negatively about another book that's extremely popular in 
of with most fantasy readers. I'm going to be talking about The Name of the Wind. And, you know, again, if you enjoy these books, by all means, go forth. Enjoy. Everyone is allowed to have their own right. personal taste. But the main character, Kvoth, in The Name of the Wind also really struggles with this issue. He is so good at everything that he does, whether it be magic, whether it be surviving, whether it be physicality, whether it be music. Mm -hmm. That's a huge thing for him is he's this phenomenal musician that there's never any sense of stakes in the story. Right. So I actually did finish that book because there's lots of other things to admire about the book. The main character is my main problem with it and the way that female characters are articulated, but that's a different topic. But the problem with it is that, like, I never worried, oh, is he going to face no, this next challenge? It robs it of its tension. Exactly. Because you're just like, well, we've just spent, like, chapters upon chapters mm -hmm. of him having no issues. So yeah. why would I think that there would suddenly be an issue? Yeah. I think we want to, like, look at these two books, too, from a perspective of these are both male characters with male writers first person perspective. perspectives yeah and it's also their first books both of them are yeah their first novel that they wrote and produced and, and as very young men yeah we will note yeah. that <laughs> yeah. and, I, and i do think that it is um a sign of maybe some immature writing because i do think that patrick rothfuss has quite a talent for writing prose he writes some beautiful lines he has some lovely imagery in his book and so i would really really like to see him move away from this character so we can get a different type of story yeah i mean i will agree like i i can, i will say that red rising i think moves very quickly the writing is very readable that's not the issue it's just that it's very difficult i think in general to connect to uh characters that have no flaws yeah because we as humans are fully aware of our own flaws or and we so, ought to be apparently some people walk around thinking that they're fine but i'm not one of those people <laughs> i'm riddled with anxiety <laughs> so when you read a character who has who can walk into the most dangerous situations be like whatever yeah yeah like or you're just like i feel like that's often the most effective mm -hmm. writing is when you can sit there and be like man i so entirely feel what this character is going through and i'm just like Dude, like you're gonna die. Yeah. Except for you're not, because you're perfect. So what do I care? You know, yeah. like you can't. I wish care. you would. <laughs> yeah. At some point, just somebody punch this guy. Yeah. You know? Well, and I think it's one of those things that people, young people, often, you know, now that we're aged in our 30s and 40s over here, oh my. like, <laughs> you know, there's this misconception about like being cool is cool when you're young but actually being cool is extremely boring and so when you write the ultimate cool character it's the most boring character on yeah. the planet to be yeah. honest there's just nothing there's nothing that draws you to them everything kind of pushes you away mm -hmm. and i think we were, we were kind of discussing like in these circumstances it's kind of hard to separate the author from mm -hmm. these characters and you can't like you know you shouldn't yeah. You know you shouldn't connect these two. But yeah. when the character is writing first person and like there are a lot of ideals expressed about himself with no self-awareness whatsoever, it's kind of, you sort of, I don't think, it's hard and, not to inadvertently start thinking negatively well, about the writer because you're just like, why do you think this is cool? Yeah. Explain to me how you think this is a likable person that I should get behind as a hero. Yeah. And I think it really comes down to that is that there is no sense from the narrative framework that, you know, that even though the character maybe thinks that they're flawless, that maybe if we take it one step back, the narrative is sort of pointing out to us, well, they're kind of wrong about that. And it, there's even an opportunity, more so perhaps with Name of the Wind, because Quoth is an older man now. He's at the oh, end of his yeah. life, reflecting on his life as a young man. And what older man like looks at his youth with mm. like no sense of oh yeah i could have done this better or i really had to grow and mature through this you know and so that narrative even like maturing and distance from the, like the actual events of the yeah. novel there's none of that there so the no novel is necessarily putting forth i agree, agree. with this perspective yeah, yeah. The, the 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 narrator's perspective is the novel's perspective yeah i mean red rising is in actually the present tense mm -hmm. so that gives it like a very strong like you are here with this character right now yeah and you cannot like there's nothing there's no circumstances around him that are saying like oh no like he's actually got some growth yeah everything is meant to be like you're right here right now and man he's good at this you yeah. know and i think also again it t talking about really sucking the emotional power out of a story is again 
in the name of the wind, our main character goes through some, some really tragic stuff. His parents die really early in his life. He ha faces struggles. You know, he's not, he faces poverty. He faces lack in his life. He faces all of these kinds of struggles. But because the character is so unrelatable through his perfection, I, again, I'm like, well, I guess he's sad about his parents, but I'm not connected I mean, I with you. him. I actually had the same exact experience with Red Rising because very early on in the book, he experiences a very tragic loss. And I had recently read a book that had like a similar, you know, spousal loss. And like, I sobbed my way through that chapter. Yeah. But when I got to this section, you were kind of just like, eh. oh, okay, so she's dead, I yeah. guess. And like, you know, he's sad, but there's also this like, but tough, you yeah. know, and it's just like, okay, so yeah. you're tough in your way through this because once again, you are just perfect. Yeah. So one of the things that I think really comes forth in the comparison of these two books is that we, again, have two male characters who are idealized as sort of archetypally mm. perfect male, male. characters. Yeah. So what are some of the traits that we see, you know, kind of rising to the fore as maybe gendered traits for these characters in their perfection. Well, I think with Res Rising, like physical strength is such a harped upon segment of the story. Yep. Like he is physically perfection. He can do like things that everyone can't do physically. You know, at some point his physics are enhanced. Yeah. So then he's even more physically strong and capable, you know, and it's, it becomes such a, pounded down point of like how physically strong he is that he's the protector because he's so physically strong and it's like are we cavemen now yeah. like this is okay you're a big dude who can yeah. do all the strong stuff and that's i feel like a very immature like thing to be so obsessed with and be mm -hmm. like well men are strong yeah. so this guy is super strong yeah you know like that's a very typical male male trait that is almost a little bit more comic book character than it is a character that should be you should be experiencing in a novel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Kvoth, same thing. He is a fantastic warrior, so that definitely yeah. comes to the fore. He can kill monsters like nobody else. Um, he is perhaps maybe less emotionally nonchalant than what you were talking about. For what is the main character's name in Red Rising? Oh, um, <laughs> putting you on the spot. Darrow. There we go. Darrow. <laughs> what a dumb name. <laughs> and there's like a scene where he's like, I will not give up my name. You know, and you're just like, oh, okay. Neither shall my progeny with my big di Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Uh. <laughs> and so that, yeah. Anyway, um, this is a G-rated podcast. So <laughs> we'll try to keep it there. But sometimes, you know, it just makes me so angry. Sometimes you just have to... Let yeah. out my rage, <laughs> my female rage. Okay, so masculinity, great warriors, great fighters, super, super strong, emotionally. Like, yeah, the stoicism, the stoicism. classic male stoicism is also a big thing in there. Like, you know, yeah. his his wife dies and he just stands strong. You know, like he's, he's faced with these terrible trials. He stands strong. I mean, it's yeah. just a very classic honestly anglo yeah. male stereotypes yeah very much like a, a cowboy yeah. if you will type of stereotype does he have a drinking issue i'm just curious you know he does get drunk a couple of times and i that's only really interesting. i only read 100 pages so yeah. 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 that's really interesting yeah all, all I, that was men, just a random question for all me. the men get drunk a couple of times <laughs> yeah well because you know you gotta like let your emotions out some way so you drink yeah yeah that's it articulated way that you're allowed to do it. So on the other end of the gender spectrum, yeah, okay. we have a couple of books to talk about. Um, <laughs> first impression. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize we were talking about this. That, that book. <laughs> yes. Okay. 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 I haven't actually read that, but I've read quite a few. Uh, we're both massive Jane Austen fans. Yes. And I've read some, Solid. some like fan, you know, adjacent I don't recommend this one. I don't recommend any of the ones this, that I've read. Yeah. This, and this is, I will fully admit, this is junk food literature yeah. and it's more peeps than Snickers. Yeah. But sometimes all you have the energy for is peeps. So mm -hmm. you, you, you dive in with regrets. Yeah. And that's okay. <laughs> you eat the peeps. Maybe you enjoy some of the peeps while you're at it, but you have a tummy ache later and you, you kind you, of regret it. You can't avoid the tummy ache. Yeah. Okay, but I wanted to talk about um, An Old Fashioned Girl by Louisa May Alcott. This is a deep cut because this is like not, this is not Little Women. No. <laughs> There's not many people read this book. 
Um, and for good reason. <laughs> <laughs> so our main character in this book is Polly. Literally, she's a Pollyanna, okay? Quite literally. Yeah, and it's just, you know, she's coming and visiting her cousin. She's from the country. Her cousins live in the city. She's an old-fashioned girl. She has old-fashioned mores. She doesn't wear makeup. She's critical of women who do. She's very modest. She's very proper. She's very um, nurturing. Even as a child, she's nurturing the father of the household, who's basically her marriage. Uncle, so she's like the mother figure from his early, early right, age. Exactly, that's very toxic. This is <laughs> this is not how we really want to articulate gender interactions. But you know, she, she, you know, she takes the time when he's hard at work and he's mm. coming home, and it's been a long day to get out his slippers and meet him at the because, gate and welcome him because home. Because women from their very inception are mothers. Exactly. Yes, they're born into mothering, and they have that nurturing biologically yeah. like just built into them and so she really sets up this sort of idealized icon of femininity mm -hmm. yes you know she's like 12 years old it's really gross when you think about it yeah and then you know and then she becomes the flashpoint that the cousins compared to and all of the other women who are even worse than the cousins because the cousins like she's just like maybe being tempted into bad ways you know maybe mm -hmm. being tempted by the flash of the city and like a little bit you know and uh and it's like, oh, well, you're not like Polly in these ways. You're not like Polly in so these ways. So it's like blah, blah, blah. all analysis of women. Yes. And it's just, of course, to articulate women and to idealize women both as attractive, as nurturing, as um, sort of the safe space in the home. This very sort of Victorian ideal, even though Louisa May Alcott is writing later, she's really putting but that she's into She's solidifying her work. that and going yeah. back to that. That yeah. is... I mean, because that ideal holds. Yeah, like, I that, mean, it's still with us. Today yeah, like so that ways. that idea, like the idea that like oh, girls are born mothers, and from the earliest age, all they want to do is like nurture and love. And yeah. which I'm not saying women don't love yeah. and nurture, and but like the core, like just be yeah. like, let's look at this very little girl and see a mother. Yeah. Let's do that. That yeah. that to me is very uncomfortable. Yeah. So that is sort of the role that's articulated forth in an old fashioned girl. What about First Impressions? First Impressions, a much more recent book, um, I believe written in the late 90s, and uh, which we should just note that First Impressions was the original title of Pride and Prejudice. This is a modern version of Pride and Prejudice. And the character that is Lizzie Bennet um, is introduced to us right off the bat. We got a paragraph to explain who she is. She has a master's degree, she's passed the bar, she's starting her own law firm, she spent a year as a missionary, she's working on multiple marathons right now. She is perfect in all of the areas. She's a perfect in terms of professional and education, she's perfect in terms of morality, she's given her time to missionary, she's perfect in terms of like physical physique because she's, you know, keeping fit for these marathons. And it's like, we are gonna backstory dump all of this right at the first chapter, like one of the earliest paragraphs, and now we can go on to the story. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting considering like the age of the writer. It brought me back to a interview I'd heard with the very first woman who was hired to work in the Waldorf Astoria um, kitchens mm -hmm. in the 1970s. And she talked about how she was expected to be 100% perfect. The male chefs could lose their temper, get emotional, make mistakes. But if she showed a, a hint of emotion or a slightest mistake, the response would be like, oh, I knew you couldn't do this. Right. And so I feel like women of this age level have this idea that like, in order for a woman to be a hero, in order for a woman to fill these roles, she first has to present a face of like perfection. Like she is worthy of being here. Yeah. She has proven that she can be the hero of this story. Right. And it's also uncomfortable. Yeah, it's this idea that women are not worthy of humanity intrinsically, but that they have to prove, prove their humanity, then they can be taken seriously, exactly. then and they then can then be then given respect, and go forth and be the hero of the story. Yeah, and uh, I feel like that is like a very like early stage of feminism, when yeah. we were still not bucking patriarchal ideals. Yeah. We were trying to just fight with that and be like, I too can be yeah. everything that you want of me. It's that anything you can do, I can do better. Um, and, and that's really what happens when you layer feminism without 
dismantling the patriarchy yeah, is yeah. that she still has to be an object de of desire. She still has to be attractive. Now we're going to open up education to women. So she has to be the, the top, top of her of their class. class. She has to then go all the way. Then we're going to open up like high Professional. elite professionalism for women. And so it's she only has acceptable to... that she has like this super high level traditionally male job. And she, by like the age of 30 has reached like a pinnacle for it. Exactly. And so she has to out compete in that, but without dismantling all of the other things, of the stereotypes that we see in the old fashioned girl, these just get stacked up on top of that. And I do. And you still have the same old fashioned girl, girl thing. Yeah. Plus. But yeah, because I do think that like the idea of like introducing, well, she was a missionary mm -hmm. is like, don't worry, she's still a nurturing woman. Exactly. You know, like trying to establish that. And the idea that like, oh, also we're going to throw in there that she's a marathon runner. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, she's still attractive. Yeah. Like she's done all of these professional things, but don't worry, she's still a good lady. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of a weird meshing of like, Oh yeah, we're feminists, but also don't worry, we're women type of, you yeah. know, thing. Yeah. So what's the outcome for her in this book? Does she get married and have kids? Absolutely. And does she maintain her professional career? As far as I remember, she does, but she becomes like a pro bono type lawyer. So it can only be nurturing. Right, exactly. She's she's, she's a now professional nurturer. <laughs> yeah, she's exited the rat race, the competitiveness, the, the like high profile, you know, lawyer. Well, because like then she can have as much time as she needs for her children mm -hmm. and she can just work when she like feels like emotionally like she should do this. Why? Because Darcy is her provider. Yes. She doesn't have to provide for herself, which goes back to the, of course, the male archetype that we were talking about earlier. And, and it is the same sort of, we do create the same issue that we're seeing in Red Rising or Name of the Wind, where as like average people just reading this book, you're just like, that's extremely oh. off-putting. Yeah, like I don't, I don't associate with this yeah. character. I don't know anybody like this character who's achieved everything by thirty. I mean, honestly, like this type of person, you probably wouldn't really be able to be friends with because yeah. they're so focused on themselves and their own achievements. It's just like, do you... when would you hang out and grab a coffee with? Yeah, this exactly. And on top of that, you wouldn't. Want... Well, okay. So here's the other thing that I think like makes me so angry about stuff like this because. I have no problem with people also loving Jane Austen and being inspired by her world. Of course we all want to be there hanging out with Elizabeth Bennet. Elizabeth Bennet is one of the most likable characters in the whole yes. canon yes. of Jane Austen. And she's extremely flawed. Pride or prejudice could both, both be attributed to her. And she needs to grow and change her views. She, you know, thinks that Wickham, is, she's totally taken in by Wickham and, you know, doesn't realize that he's deceiving her. She has all of these issues that, and, and on top of that, she maintains her likability. And this is someone that I would never want to be friends with. No, because it becomes about the accomplishments and mm -hmm. not the character. Yeah. Elizabeth Bennet is more of a human. Like she's, yeah. I mean, I know we can't like attribute the same things like, oh, she's sure. got any level of you know, achievement or things like that. Yeah. But we just get to know Elizabeth Bennet as a human being, both her, you know, delightful side and her human side. Mm -hmm. And as humans, we can be like, yeah, we kind well, of all I mean, have those issues. If, you we, know? if we look at her within the, you know, sort of societal expectations of what a woman should accomplish, she is very accomplished. Right. And in fact, there's a whole conversation about it when she's at, um, uh, the first time she's visiting when her sister's sick and they're like, oh, you know, talking about everything that a woman should do. And Darcy compliments her. She's well read. She has wonderful taste in music. She's socially capable more so than perhaps any of her other sisters. But also she, when he starts complimenting her, she just kind of <laughs> like, like pulls whatever, over. Buddy. Like, yeah, she's not just like, yeah, I am. Exactly. You know, That's she's just like, charm of their relationship. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say well read. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah. She refuses to be kind of articulated into those ideals, which yeah. is really funny because the this author is forcing mm -hmm. Elizabeth to articulate herself so into her, these yeah. 90s ideals of you can have it all as a woman. Yeah, kind of like, and, and I need to have it all. Yeah, like, otherwise I'm not I don't have value. Yeah, I'm not legitimate until I have it all. Yeah, so it's really unfortunate that this author wasn't able to see that sort of the sophistication, the beauty, the effectiveness of that wonderful novel is Elizabeth's flaws. And I find it really interesting that we have, in essence, a more mature view of women mm -hmm. at Jane Austen's time than we do in the 1990s. Yeah. Although I do always kind of give a little bit of credit to like women who clearly came of age in the 70s because that was a really hard time to be yep. a woman and to be like entering the professional world like so many women were at that time and getting the full brunt of yeah. like, I'm like, part of me is like, you didn't do a good job of this. And part of me is like, you probably have a lot of scars. Yeah. <laughs> fair, fair enough. But also, 
this was not that great of a book. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. We can have multiple feelings these, about yeah, things all can, at once. These are complex feelings. Yes. You know, and like I I can't feel quite the same way about like a, a Pierce Brown who wrote Red Rising because I'm kind of like I I can't like find anything in that like historical background of like this makes sense other than like maybe you're just like really struggling with some insecurities and this is the way you're getting out but also you don't want to re- you don't want to read a book and be like so you, you're struggling with insecurities dude that yeah. that what going on right now yeah. <laughs> you know like yeah. you don't want to feel that about the writer because in a way like when you like a book it's hard not to like have some kind of emotional like good or bad feelings towards the writer themselves yeah. And right or wrong, yeah. that's just how we experience books. We kind of connect to the writer as we connect to the characters. Right, absolutely. I think, too, you know, one of the things that really happens, whether you have this idealized male character or this idealized feminine character, is the way that you have to plot your stories really changes because right. there is no internal growth, there is no internal conflict. And so all of the conflict has to be externalized. It right. has to be a big bad outside of yourself. It has to be, in the case of female characters, what you'll often see is them sort of pushing back at the immoral world on the outside to create right. a pure sanctum. For the male characters, it's obviously doing war. What else? <laughs> you know, but these, because they're operating right. within these stereotypes so strongly, their, their challenges are also stereotypical. Right. Maybe that's part of what makes them so freaking boring. Yeah, because these are stories that we've like, heard a thousand times. I mean, yeah. honestly, when we were talking about Name of the Wind and Red Rising, there were so many times yeah. where you were like, oh yeah, that happens in Name of the Wind. And I was like, oh yeah, that happens in Red yeah. Rising. Like, there's just, when you force yourself into such severe stereotypes, yeah. your plot almost just naturally becomes mm-hmm. a very like tired, overused plot line. Yeah. Um, so speaking of the way in which a perfect character really constrains um, a writer, did you want to talk about your third book? Uh, my third book, yes, was just a, a a little mystery that I read quite some time ago from the Million Dollar Mystery series. Um, <laughs> this was at a different time in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and what's it called? Uh, it's called A Quarter for a Kiss. Um, and I remember, like, this was literally, like, 20 years ago, um, at which time, like, I was enjoying books like this. I feel like I keep it because, like, you know, at that time I enjoyed it. But I also yeah. am like, I will never go back and read it because that will probably be a... a hey, a man, ring. I, like, <laughs> the, we all go through journeys yeah. in our writing. And part of the fun of that, and I've talked about this with you before on, like, side conversations because we hang out a lot. This is just what we talk about, okay? Yeah. Like, a lot. It's kind of fun to see the way that you grow as a reader, yeah. how more sophisticated your perspective becomes as you read more widely, things that were challenging before you can actually access. It's a great journey to go on. That's why you keep reading. Exactly. Yeah. So, mystery novel, mm-hmm. character is same throughout. She's like the detective character. And the issue I have with this series, and even had back when I wasn't that great of a writer, is the writer keeps... Um, in essence writing herself into plot walls. Her character hits a, a, a wall and instead of being like, oh, I probably need to go back and write this in a more logical way, the character just suddenly has something that solves the issue. And for this book in particular, it was probably the worst. The detective character, you know, is like sneaking along, listening into the doors, and she overhears characters that she thinks are the villains, but they're talking in Japanese. And this character, like who, this is several books in, this has never come up. No, no reference to this. All of a sudden is like, good thing that I spent a year in Japan in high school and I'm still completely fluent in Japanese. And it's just like, it really makes more sense to you to do that than to have two people in America speaking English. Like that's what makes more, but it's just like the writer, it's, it's lazy. The writer is not. It's just writing kind of to their conclusion and then being like, oh shoot, that's a, that's a rough wall to hit. Instead of backing up, because it's totally okay to realize that you just wrote yourself into a wall and you just need to back up and be like, where can I write this? Instead, it's like, I'm just going to keep going and I'm just going to give the character, in essence, superpowers. Mm-hmm. You know, like, highly unlikely if you spent a year in Japan 15 years ago yeah you would be fluent in Japanese in your 30s yeah you know like that's 
not a legitimate thing. That is a superpower in that essence. And that is such a common thing I feel like immature writers do because they're unwilling to, in essence, like kill their darlings. They're unwilling to be like, oh, I didn't write this well. I'll go back and rewrite it. They're just like, oh, well, this was my original idea. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just going to keep going and yeah. just keep giving the character more and more superpowers to yeah. keep barreling through. Yeah. And this is, this is why good writers have a lot of revisions like yeah. like we talked about before um i believe the first drafts of uh like pride and prejudice yeah, yeah. are parent are like borderline unreadable and that's totally okay like yeah. that's just where you're just throwing down your ideas and you're fully aware that this needs to be rewritten <laughs> yeah 100 percent. you know it's just like it's very interesting because this is what's called like the day of sex machina problem. And this is literally something that Aristotle critiques. So we're going back and <laughs> this is a problem. This yeah. is a problem for a long time. Yeah. And so it's this idea that like you can just kind of pull out of your back pocket the the solution to whatever problem. Right. So this happens really, really bad in a lot of fantasy writing because you actually have, have a magic. magical world. Yeah. Like so you can just like, pull that one out. One of the things that I don't like. Okay. So this is sort of like a totally... A, like meta level up topic is like people who presume that criticism is intellectually superior to enjoyment. Mm, and I, yeah. and I rejected that position wholeheartedly. Um, just because I'm being critical of it doesn't mean that I have a more sophisticated position or my opinion is better or whatever, whatever. That's not, that's and not who I am as a person or my approach to the world. I just happen to be really bothered by these particular. Well, and also issues. I feel like we need to acknowledge that we write Oh, sorry. We read from different like mm -hmm. perspectives. Most people aren't reading books from the perspective of having edited them, mm -hmm. but having edited books, I'm now like, it's hard for me not to read a book and be like, well, that should have been taken out. Yeah. Well, that should have been developed a bit more. And while some people might think that like, oh, that must be terrible. It's not. I just enjoy it. <laughs> and it yeah. gives me lots of things to talk about. Yeah. Whereas like you come from a perspective of like, you've had a lot of background in literary analysis. Yep. So that's how you're going to read. It is true. And it, you know, I've, I've actually talked about this a lot before on my TikTok and other places of like, there, there really is something gained and something lost. So when someone says to me, oh, is that how you read books? Like, don't you ever read for fun? And I'm like, oh no, this, this is, is fun. fun. <laughs> yeah, this is fun for me. I love doing this actually. And so it's like, yes, it gives me access to the ability to read things on a deeper level and maybe, yeah. you know, quote unquote, get more out of a book or whatever the case may be, however you want to articulate that idea. But there is something lost in it because I do remember that just in like delicious, I'm eating this up like a juicy peach enjoyment when I was a kid in fifth grade. I could read books like this. <laughs> yeah, you know, like a kid, and it's summertime and I'm blasting I through do. like yeah. my 15th Saddle Club book because I just love yeah. being in this world. Yeah. Um, and I had no sense of its quality. I had no real sense of like any kind of deeper issues going on, but I just enjoyed the stories and the characters so much I wanted to be in that world. And yeah, I don't often have that experience anymore because my critical brain has been so like you know, turned on. If that you one's, like, it's got some workout going. Yeah. It's the, those muscles are very well developed. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I recognize that there is a certain way of reading for entertainment and joy that I don't get to, um, access as often as I did when I was a younger reader and well, that's okay. I do. I will have to say like, well, yes, I could just blow through all the books and just enjoy them. Mm -hmm. For me, like I used to, when someone would ask me if I liked this book, I would say yes. Mm -hmm. And that was just it because yeah. that's all I experienced was like, you know, enjoyment. Mm -hmm. Whereas now, like I have a lot of people in my life that when you say like, did you like this book? I can have like a full conversation on it and they can give me like feedback. And so for me, like be reading books on a deeper level has actually oh, developed it. relationships for mm -hmm. me because we have things to talk about and mm -hmm. I can be like, Oh, I like this about it, but I didn't like this about it. Yeah. Or this was, you know, well written, but then this made me uncomfortable. Yeah. And, like you just have, for me at least a richer experience mm -hmm. and you do have the issue of you maybe don't enjoy <laughs> books at, like as often, mm -hmm. but I also enjoy a lot of books. There are, yeah. even if you're going to look at something from a, a, like an analytical perspective, there are a lot of good books out there that yeah. hold up to analysis. Yeah. And I find too that they are actually, so we're in literary society together. I have an episode on that on my YouTube and tomorrow we're doing literary society. on. So books we're going to start this all over tomorrow, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but with more people, yes. <laughs> which means I get to talk less. 
But, um, <laughs> you know, we're, t we're actually talking about books that you would reread. And that's also kind of one of the joys of like reading deeper and better is the books that you can reread really I mean, stand up to it. Yes, you know? Yes. You, like, you, they're like top tier books, you know? And you can reread. Like yeah. you, f you find books that are worth it and yeah. are, have the quality. And they are out there. They tell you something more every time you engage with it. Whereas something like this, even if you never, you know, ex advanced beyond, you know, I shouldn't say advanced, but you know, move if you move to a different level, yeah, yeah. If you stayed at that level and you were totally happy to read for entertainment, and those books were candy for you, even then, you probably wouldn't go back and reread that book. No, and and I will say like. I had a lot of books from this time period I liked. Mm -hmm. I had almost none that I was like passionate about. Mm -hmm. I have books that I'm passionate about now, yeah. you know, and like I'd rather feel that than being like, yeah. I wrote like, I read like 20 books this year that were fun, you know, yeah. and then that's where, you know, I leave it because yeah. that's all I brought. All I've brought as a reader is like, I'm looking for some fun. Yeah. I, I mean, I still read a lot of fun books. Yeah. They're just, a lot better than this. <laughs> yeah. And this kind of goes back to really what the heart of this podcast is about, which is that like there is a mutual responsibility. Right. There's a responsibility that the author has to the reader, but there's also a responsibility that the reader, reader has, has to the artwork or to the to the author. It is a conversation. It always is. It is uh, art is communication from the artist to the audience, wh whether you're painting right. or writing or whatever it is. When you think about even something like this, like that's hard to do. It's a hard accomplishment to write a book, even a bad book. Right. Yeah. You know what? It, You've put a lot of time into that. Yeah. And so it's quite disrespectful, I think, on the part of the reader to just kind of be flippant right about, about it. it. And so that's why I take a lot of pride in my perspective as a reader, because like I give books a fair shot. Yes. I really respect the author's like effort right. into this. Yeah. This is why when people say to me like, oh, should I leave like a two star review on this? And I'm like, if there's something in the book that's like honestly offensive and you like a trigger warning or something that you came in and didn't realize was there, um, I, yes, like leave a bad review so that people know like there's something kind of morally offensive here and you need to be aware of it. If it just turned out that it wasn't, you know, your flavor of book, honestly, I wouldn't leave a two star review. That's just, I didn't like it because that really does more harm than good, mm -hmm. you know? So that, that I would feel like is more like the reader's responsibility to the writer. Be aware that's hard. Yeah. Like writing a book is hard. Yeah. Writers, you still need to do a good job. Even putting in a lot of work does not negate doing a good job, <laughs> but also readers like this is hard. This is really hard. And writers are putting themselves out there into the world. And I mean, I respect that. Yeah. So anything else before we wrap this up? I think we've kind of covered it all. <laughs> writers, be responsible. <laughs> Readers, be responsible. Right. <laughs> We're just policing everyone in this episode. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, we are. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So for those of us who are watching this on YouTube, we're, our podcast is available now on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. So you can take us to go. Yes. And if you want to continue watching us on my YouTube channel, I am at youtube.com slash, slash a lovely jaunt. And we will be back next month with another episode. Thank you, Emily. Exciting. <laughs>